Okay guys, we are up to the topic of new technology as we work our way through Unit 2, the Industrial Revolution. And we are going to talk about what you might call the later Industrial uh, Revolution in this video and talk about some new technologies that are going to come online, uh, many of which we still use to the present day. So, let's look at our first topic and we're going to begin by talking about metal of all things. And when you think of the early Industrial Revolution, you think of metal, you think of iron. What metal is going to replace iron is steel. So let's look at the steel industry and see what's going on there in the 1800s. Steel production, guys, is going to be the key to building the modern world. So the later Industrial Revolution, guys, uh, it the building block of that revolution is steel. And because steel is so important to building uh, modern uh, you know, buildings and railroads and everything else, um, it becomes a source of national pride. In other words, a way for uh, nations to compete and to show their, their power is they produce more steel than others. What gets the steel production, um, kind of, uh, leaping forward is this thing called the Bessemer process. It was an invention of Henry Bessemer, a British metallurgist, and he comes up with this new process in 1856 of producing steel. And uh, this is what's called the Bessemer converter. This is where all the the uh, process is actually taking place. The end result of the Bessemer process is a, a cheaper, higher quality higher quality steel so we're producing better quality and also cheaper steel and production begins to skyrocket and you see Bessemer converters being built across all industrial nations um, a good example of a Bessemer converter you can see it this one's right here in a um, park in Pittsburgh Pittsburgh of course was the steel city um, famously uh, famous for its major steel mills uh, in, the 18, uh, in the 1800s and 1900s that's why the team's called the Steelers, by the way. All right, let's look at one of our great American inventors, Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, look at his inventions and how they changed the world. Um, so if you invent something, guys, you want to get yourself a patent. And a patent is basically the legal right for you and only you to produce that good. We have patents to protect inventors and also to encourage inventors because if patents didn't exist, no one would take the time to invent something because all the time and energy you put into inventing something would be thrown away when someone stole it from you at the last second. So a patent is very important to encourage inventors. Uh, Thomas Edison himself had over a thousand patents to his name. And many of these came from his uh, laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey. And Menlo Park was almost like an invention factory. Thomas Edison would hire um, really the best and brightest scientists and, and engineers to come work for him and develop new technologies. Uh, so let's look at just a couple of examples of some of Thomas Edison's works. Uh, one would be the stock ticker, which was invented in 1869. This device is connected to the telegraph and allows people um, to know the price of stocks in real time, even though they live far away from New York City or wherever uh, stocks are being traded. So it's, it's, a, it's an invention that's going to help business and businessmen invest wisely. 1877, uh, Thomas Edison, that's him on the left, invented the phonograph. And the phonograph um, is basically an early version of what we would call the record player. So now you can record sound and play it after the fact. That was um, remarkable and uh, really life-changing. 1879, uh, Edison comes up with the long-lasting light bulb. Now, many people, of course, point to the fact that it's wrong to say Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. And it is true. He did not invent the light bulb. There were others before him who came up with light bulbs. But their light bulbs tended to be very short-term uh, things that were unreliable. His is a, lot, a light bulb that will last long periods of time. And the light bulb itself was made after, you know, many, many, many hours of trial and error of trying to figure out exactly how you make this. And the way the light, the light bulb that he invented worked was you had this thing called the filament. And the filament is that little piece of metal that goes through an old incandescent light bulb. Electricity is sent through the wire and the wire heats up and glows. And that's what gives you the light. Now, if you look at these two quotes from Edison, guys, I think they tell us something about him. And the first quote is, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. The second quote, 
I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. And if you put those quotes together, I think what they tell you about Thomas Edison is this is a guy who really worked hard and pushed himself and never gave up, who was persistent and uh, just didn't let uh, you know obstacles get in his way. He's not going to let setbacks uh, cause him to, to, to quit. He's going to keep pushing, keep pushing until he invents whatever it is he's looking at. 1894, uh, Edison's team of engineers come up with the motion picture camera. And, of course, uh, you know, <laughs> nothing's ever been uh, the same since because now we can record uh, moments of history and replay them. Uh, this, by the way, is Fred Ott's sneeze on the bottom left. Fred Ott worked in Thomas Edison's lab, and they were basically testing out the camera and had him uh, sit down and sneeze for the camera. All right, well, let's now go on to some breakthroughs in communication, and uh, let's think about the telegraph. We talked about the telegraph and its connection uh, to the stock ticker a few moments ago, and the way the telegraph works is it uses electricity. And Samuel F. B. Morse, you can see him down there in the bottom left, uh, he's the one who created the telegraph. The word, the word telegraph literally means distance writing or writing from a distance, and that's what this does. By using electric pulses, messages can be sent long distances using Morse code. And we've all seen Morse code, seen it in, um, or heard it maybe in a video like, or in a movie or something. Uh, it's a way of, of translating these dots and dashes, which are uh, short and long pulses, um, into letters. By the way, Samuel Morse was not just a great inventor of things like the telegraph. He also was a very, very talented painter. Uh, this, for example, is one of his paintings called The Gallery of the Louvre. And what this is, is basically um, he's created a, a replica of all these famous paintings into one big painting. All right, now there's a major limitation of telegraph, and that, of course, is the fact that it doesn't actually carry voice. Um, and so a Scottish-American inventor named Alexander Graham Bell in 1876 worked to fix that, and he came up with the telephone, which means uh, basically sound from a distance. That's what the word literally means. And the way this works is, like the telegraph, it's going to work along lines of electricity. So you're sending these these pulses down the electric lines and replicated as sound on the other side. Now, the telephone itself is going to uh, really make the world a much smaller place because now you can talk to someone in real time uh, from, from hundreds, if not thousands of miles away. Uh, and to, to connect people, you had operators who would operate a switchboard. And a switchboard is where they would literally t like take one line and plug it into another place to connect people. Uh, so when you see these old movies and someone picks up the phone, they're like, operator, can you connect me to so-and-so? They're literally doing that. They're connecting the, their line to someone else's line. All right, number four, guys. Main idea number four, let's look at transportation changes. And uh, let's talk about the automobile. I mean, the car um, really is a part of the American character. Everybody uh, can't wait until they get their license and get their first car. It's this exhilarating sense of freedom that you have. But even though it's really ingrained in the American character, we didn't invent the car. The automobile was invented by Germany. Uh, Carl Benz gets credit for inventing the first uh, car, the Motorwagen, as, as it was called, in 1886. Let's see, it's kind of a tri wheel design there. And then another German named Gottlieb Daimler invented the four wheeled automobile in 1887. So, kind of the really the precursor of the modern car right here. Uh, two years before that, he, into, he had invented the motorcycle as well. So a lot of motor travel we can credit to the Germans. Here is a, uh, an example of, uh, example rather of Daimler's original motorcycle. doesn't look like a motor, uh, modern motorcycle, of course, but you can kind of see it's, it's there. It's basically the same. All right, now let's look at building these vehicles. And building something as complicated as a car would definitely take a long time, especially if you had just one employee working, you know, all the steps. It would take forever. So to speed the process up, the assembly line was created. And the assembly line basically um, has the product 
um, moving and not the uh, the worker. So the worker is stationary and he or she performs one or two steps repeatedly over and over and over again so they get really efficient at it. And the product itself moves along a conveyor belt. And so as the as the car uh, comes by you would maybe uh, you know put one of the tires on or maybe you would put the steering wheel on or something like that. And by breaking down the the, the actual uh, process of building a car it becomes more efficient and much more um, uh, much much more quick to to produce these goods and of course the more quickly you make them and more efficient you make them the lower the cost goes and all of a sudden these things can become much more affordable to people and when you think of an American when you think of the assembly line and you think of affordable cars of course the name that comes to mind is Henry Ford and here is Henry Ford's very first car the quadricycle that was he created in 1896, but what we think of with Henry Ford is the Model T, right? And the Model T was really, truly the first affordable mass-produced car. It was a car uh, for the masses. It was a car that even working-class people could eventually afford because the price kept dropping and dropping and dropping. And the reason it's dropping is Henry Ford uh, made everything very standardized, very efficient, um, and they didn't change the Model T very much as it was being built over the years. All right, so our last uh, look at transportation, of course, is going to be the issue of flight. And flight is something that's been fascinating humans, I mean, from the beginning of time. From the first time a human set eyes on a bird, they wondered how the bird flew and how uh, humans could do the same. And if you look at all the contraptions that were invented, uh, in the 1800s to fly, uh, in retrospect, we look at those things and think, well, gosh, they, those things were never going to fly. And the reason is they just weren't designed the right way. It wasn't until 1903 that two brothers from Dayton, Ohio, built and flew the first airplane. They did this again in 1903. They flew it in North Carolina. Their names were Orville and Wilbur Wright. And the momentous day was December 17th, 1903, when Orville is, uh, makes that very first flight. So there's Orville. He's kind of laying down on his stomach there. The engines, I mean, it's kind of hard to see him, but there's one and two engines here. Oh, I, I take that back. There's, there's one engine and then two propellers. Uh, and you can see the, the chain here that connects the engine to the propellers. And this flight was not very long. It only went about 120 feet, lasted not even quite a minute. Um, but what they did was they changed history because the idea that humans could get up in the air and they could fly long distances quickly um, is going to change just everything in human history uh, for the good and the bad, right? Because, of course, this technology can be used for things like warfare. So the airplane is a very good but also can be kind of a bad technology as well. All right, guys, that is our quick look at how uh, technology was changing. We looked at new forms of uh, transportation. We looked at new forms of communication. Um, we also uh, just kind of looked at the effects of these new technologies on people and how the world was changing. And I know I keep saying this, guys. It sounds repetitive, but I, I want to say it one more time. All these new sciences, new technologies, new theories, they really were uh, developing the world that we know it. So we look at the 21st century we live in and we think, of, oh gosh, there's new inventions all the time. We're creating so many new things. And that's true, we are. But they were doing the same thing in the 1800s as well. Uh, the world was changing so rapidly. Um, we went from a horse and buggy era to a flight era. I mean, within a generation, it really is pretty remarkable.